nice to see you finally awake. You'd been lying there for so long I was beginning to worry you might miss your stop. Although, having said that, I haven't heard any announcements as to our whereabouts and it's so dark outside, your guess as to our location is as good as mine. In any case, it's nice to finally have a conscious companion. Where is it you're traveling to? Ah, you don't remember. Well, that's far from ideal, isn't it? I don't know how much help it'll be, but I happen to know a few tales about the lines that run the length and breadth of this country. Perhaps if I tell a few to you, it might jog your memory as to your final destination. How does that sound? Very good. I'm glad you agree, at least if nothing else. It'll help to pass the time. Between Bloomsbury and Islington lies King's Cross Station. It has existed in some capacity since 1852, during which time it has been considered an upstanding centre point of connection and industrialisation across the United Kingdom, as well as somewhere that was close to falling into disrepair. Today, its sleek, modernised design hides its somewhat turbulent past, but there are some scars that no number of cosmetic adjustments can ever truly erase. Without a doubt, the most horrifying night of the station's history occurred on the 18th of November, 1987. At that time, smoking was banned in the underground stations, but many commuters still lit matches in order to ignite their cigarettes on the escalators as they were leaving the station. On the 18th of November, one of these commuters did exactly this, only they failed to properly extinguish their match before dropping it on the floor. The still-lit match then fell down the side of the escalator, which then ignited the pool in grease underneath. The resulting fire then spread violently, ultimately injuring 100 and claiming the lives of a further 31. With all tragedies, lessons were learned, and new safety measures put in place to ensure that this could never be repeated. However, despite all of this, it is still difficult for some to move on. Since that fire, there have been numerous reports of a woman screaming, while holding her arms outstretched, wandering the corridors of the station. Some choose to flee at the sight of her, but... The good Samaritans who rush to her aid never reach her as she vanishes into thin air before they can get too close. She is widely considered an unnamed victim of the fire, but who really knows? Perhaps there is some other unknown tragedy that lies deep within King's Cross waiting to be exposed.
Perhaps I should have warned you. I'm afraid my tales aren't for the faint of heart. I have a habit of forgetting not everyone is consumed by this type of thing as I am. Still, did it help? So, still no closer to remembering then. Then again, we have only explored one single destination in a country with hundreds. Let us try one located outside of the capital. Hopefully that will land a little closer to home. Tell me though, are you feeling quite all right? You were asleep for an awfully long time, and you barely made a single sound. A little tired, you say? Well, if that's all, I suppose there isn't any real cause for concern. Forgive me, I got a little distracted. Where was I? The South Downs are a collection of rolling green hills that stretch between the urban landscape of London and the coastal Brighton. Importantly, with regards to this particular tale, they were an obstacle that needed to be overcome if the new railway line between the two corners of England were to be connected by track. During construction, its Victorian designers decided that the best course of action was to build straight through some of the hills, as opposed to attempting to build over them. This resulted in a multitude of tunnels being dug straight through the ancient countryside. The most infamous of these is the Tunnel at Clayton, an imposing structure with a flamboyant folly design that near resembles a castle rather than a mere hole in a wall of rock. Nestled within these decorative features lies a small house that used to home the signalman and his family. On August 25th, 1861, that signalman was Henry Killick. In theory, his job was simple. Ensure that the track inside of the tunnel was clear so that no trains collided while attempting to pass through it. Unfortunately, on this particular day, a series of unfortunate events led to a tragedy unfolding. The problem started at Brighton, where three trains were allowed to depart within seven minutes of each other, rather than the recommended five minutes in between each train. This meant that if anything were to go wrong with any of the trains, the time for the other drivers to react to the situation would be minimal. Unfortunately for the signalmen, passengers, and drivers on board, this is exactly what happened. Due to a signal failure, after the first train entered the tunnel, the danger sign did not reset, meaning the second train went in straight after it. Fearing a collision in the darkness, signalman Killick rushed out of his cabin waving his red flag. The driver of the second train saw this and so came to a stop in the middle of the tunnel. With the train being out of sight, Killick telegrammed the signalman on the other side of the tunnel, asking if it was all clear. At the northern end, the other signalman saw the first train leave the tunnel and, mistaking it for the train Killick was asking about, responded that the tunnel was indeed clear. Thinking the tunnel was empty, Killick sent the third train straight in, at which point it collided with the second train, which was slowly reversing out back the way that it had come in.
the locomotive of that third train obliterated, the guard's cabin of the second train, as well as its final carriage, before propelling itself on top of the now near-destroyed train, hitting the roof of the tunnel. It was the collision with the final carriage that caused the 23 deaths that day, with records stating the majority died from being burnt or scalded by the broken engine. Meeting such a violent end, perhaps it is unsurprising that people claim to hear wails and the deafening screech of twisting metal late at night when the tunnel is empty. I imagine a tragedy like that is hard to detach oneself from. Much like Killick all those years ago, it is too dark for any listener to see deeply into the tunnel, so who knows what otherworldly scene of horror plays out on dark, unassuming nights, a few hundred meters beyond the tunnel's mouth. I must apologize. Sometimes I mean to start telling one story, but it almost morphs into these horrific tales. A compulsion of sorts, I suppose you could say. Did it help at all, or only traumatize you? Well, that is good. Clearly you are made of sterner stuff than most, but it is a shame it is doing nothing for your memory. I happen to notice your eyes getting heavy as well. I hope of all things I did not bore you. That is perhaps the worst kind of fate someone like myself can experience. Tell me, are you a fan of animals? They can make good companions for long journeys such as ours, comforting and entertaining in equal measure. Although, I suppose not all that are associated with these tracks necessarily bear a good omen. But Moleskine Railway Station is, in a word, unremarkable. An old footbridge stretches over a rustling railway track, accompanied only by simple shelters that sit on the platforms, providing cover to any unlucky traveller caught in the rain. Houses and apartments surround the station on each side, but separating the track and residential area are a thick line of trees. It is said that on dark nights, a deep growling can be heard emanating from the shadows cast by the trees and station buildings. Those who have heard it claim that the sound is created by a ferocious black dog, a hound from hell. Sightings like this have occurred for decades, with countless numbers of commuters fleeing the station for fear of their lives. Those who have been brave enough to investigate the terrible sound coming from the shadows report that once investigated, it transpired there was nothing there at all, as if the thing had simply vanished into thin air. There is no definitive explanation for the reason the dog stalks the station and unlucky travellers. With that being said, many speculate that when alive, this dog was hit by one of the trains passing through Moleskine. Enraged, its spirit never left, determined to cause havoc for those who visit. Or perhaps, if we take a less cynical approach, it is just trying to keep them safe. Well, it may be indeed best that we don't have an animal companion with us. The way this journey is going so far, I'm embarrassed to say that I myself am even a little unsettled. I've never seen such an impenetrable darkness. Oh dear, you are looking rather pale. I hope my stories haven't done you any serious physical harm. 
Tell me, is it my imagination, or do you think we are slowing down? I hope for your sake we are. I would say you need a doctor, or a drink, or maybe even both. I think we probably have time for one more tale, if you would like. Although gruesome, I am afraid it is the only thing I can offer to take your mind off whatever ailment is inflicting itself upon your person. You would? Very well, then. Let me take you to North Road Station in Durham. I suppose technically this used to be North Road Station. Now retired, the building houses the Darlington Railway Centre Museum. However, despite the changing nature of the building and the new employees who call it home, one previous worker seemingly refuses to leave. Winter can often be the most draining of all the seasons. The grey days with darkness falling early and fully can make it difficult to have a consistently positive outlook. Accompanying this sentiment, small issues may be exacerbated, which can lead to spirals of full-blown depression. This unfortunate collaboration of situations is exactly what happened to one happily named Thomas Winter in February 1845. Thomas worked as a ticket clerk at the station, which meant that he would deal with the hundreds of customers that would make their way through the building each week. However, while the vast majority were polite and cordial, there was one who was particularly dissatisfied with the service they had received. Taking the complaint to heart and unable to stop the spiral of self-doubt and hatred, Thomas began to fall into a deep depression. A depression that only ended when he took himself off to the male toilet, placed a gun against his head and pulled the trigger. When eventually discovered, Winter's body was moved to the porter's cellar before eventually being transferred to the morgue. Around a decade later, a night watchman by the name of James Durham was completing his round when he spotted the figure of a man wearing a clerk's uniform walking around the station with a black Labrador by his side. Naturally, Durham went to confront the man, but upon getting close, the mysterious man attacked him. In defense, the shocked night watchman threw a punch but found his fist travel straight through the unknown intruder. Shocked, Durham did nothing as the stranger set his dog on him, which bit into his leg. Without warning, the intruder called the dog off and walked down into the porter's cellar. As Durham checked over his injuries, he was surprised to find that despite the pain being very real, the dog had drawn no blood. Determined to apprehend his attacker, Durham gave chase into the cellar, but upon reaching the bottom of the stairs, discovered that it was completely empty. It was only over the following days and weeks as he relayed this story to his colleagues that he discovered the fate of Thomas Winter, and a dark realisation swept over him as he realised it was his ghost that had attacked him that fateful night. I believe that story will conclude our time together. Forgive me for saying this, but looking at you, the sunken eyes, thin hair, emaciated physique, I think that this is probably your final destination. I don't know why I have been made to take this journey with you, but I'm afraid you must complete the final leg of it alone. Of course, there is a lot that will change, but I suppose you could try to look at the positives. Look at yourself. No more sickness. No worry. No pain. Just a kind of empty peace. 
I suppose that really is the one downside. The fact that it will be quite empty. Oh, but looking at you, I can see you've lived a full life. All those memories and experiences you'll take with you. You have the opportunity to relive your life a thousand times over, enjoying the pain and pleasure in equal measure. And who knows, maybe one day I'll come this way again. So this isn't a goodbye, just a farewell for now. Take a moment to think of me, would you? Damned to forever relive some of the most horrible occurrences to ever take place on these lands. After all these years, I long for the empty peace. Take care, and remember, don't fear the darkness. With it comes a blessed ignorance that the light cruelly takes away. <laughs>